Well, welcome to the podcast, Gregor. Thank you. It's it's great to be here. No worries. So obviously, I can I can detect a slight accent because I'm fairly uh, attuned. So w- you're you're not from the UK originally, I'm guessing. That is very true. Very astute. Well, <laughs> thank you. Well done, sir. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, so where 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 are you from uh, originally? Where, where's home? I grew you? up overseas. Both of my parents are American, but I grew up uh, sort of an army bratish kid. But I've lived in lots of countries since as well. But I've been in the UK for a long time. I just haven't shed the accent yet. No, no, oh, don't. Yeah, don't don't worry. Don't you don't want our accent? It's um, it's not it's not great. Well, there's so many to choose from, right? Like, well, that's it. Yeah, I know. I guess with the Americans, it's always they think we're either Cockneys or or the Queen, and there's there's quite mm. a bit in between that spectrum, isn't there? But um, Indeed, yes. But yeah. But we're not here to talk about accents. We're here to talk a little bit about how we got from a wolf to little tiny lap dogs and that kind of process. So I guess before we start that, what's your what's your background like? What why, why are you qualified to talk about this? I should ask firstly. Ah, uh, I and well, is anyone qualified to talk about this? <laughs> I, I don't know. I Ho- mean, hopefully you are. <laughs> well, insofar as anybody is, I I have some credentials. Uh, I've been working on dogs for about a decade and mostly from both an archeological and a genetic perspective. Uh, We've been doing a lot of ancient uh, genome and mitochondrial sequencing over the last several years and using and interpreting all the evidence that we're generating through the lens of a very archeological and evolutionary biological perspective. Okay. So obviously what what I'm here to try and find out is why would a, a wolf, you know, this, this, pack hunter, this predator, not normally associating with other predators, why would it come to a human in the first place? How did how did this process of domestication start, I suppose? And that's the $64,000 question. And there's a whole <laughs> lot of people with very strong opinions about how this process took place. And sometimes people even ask why this process took place, already inferring or assuming that humans were very deliberately intending to create lap dogs at some point. Um, I, if, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a hell of a lot more we don't know about this than what we do know. What we do know, though, is that associations between two species within nature is not a completely unusual thing. Uh, in fact, all of evolutionary biology has, you know, there's a whole study of uh, symbiosis, whereby you have three different kinds of symbiosis. You've got parasitism, you've got mutualism, and what's the third one? Uh, I've got it here, Um, um, and commensalism. So if it's mutualistic relationships, that's both benefit, both species are benefiting. If it's commensal, one is benefiting, the other was kind of neutral about it. And if it's parasitic, one is benefiting to the detriment of the other one. And there's dozens, hundreds of examples like this, where you have two, two populations and two species that have former relationships such that they become kind of mutually inter- interdependent on one another. So I take your point that yes, a apex predator and people seems like a crazy mismatch, but then so are kind of hummingbirds and flowers, you know, where you're developing all kinds of secondary sexual cr- characteristics and beaks and all kinds of things in order to sort of mutually benefit each other. So um, I don't know that just it just like superficially, I don't know how unusual it is. It kind of depends on your perspective coming to it in the first place. So how this process takes place, I suspect has something to do with the, how readily it was possible for the two species to form a kind of loose attachment or association and then become kind of acclimated to one each other, one another, and then start benefiting from the, the presence of each other, even though there's lots of reasons that we can imagine that that would be a bad thing. Uh, And there's generally two schools of thought about this. There is a a school of thought which says that this had to have been deliberate, that there is just no way that a wolf population could be attracted enough to a human population or vice versa to even get this process started. There's too much antagonism. There's too much antipathy. There's just too little benefit for each of those two populations, too much risk, frankly. And so therefore, the only way to do this is for people to know that there are wolf dens around, to go when the mother, when the parents are away and grab puppies at like, I don't know, five or six weeks or something, bring the puppies back, breastfeed them, raise them within a human setting, get them to kind of map on to people the first time they open their eyes, all that kind of stuff, and thereby incorporate the infants of a wolf species into a human society. Now, that's one school of thought, and I don't know, I know there's, it seems to me that there's more arguments 
uh, against the idea that the opposite happened, that they then interpreted as arguments in favor of that, but I haven't seen any positive arguments for it. There's no demonstration that this has ever happened before in any sort of ethnographic research that has ever led to anything like domestication. I don't know. I, and I think it's a little bit special pleading as well, because what it's already assuming is that people are doing this in, with in the intention of generating a doxa, with the intention of generating a Pomeranian. I just think it's just a little bit insane, especially when we have so many other biological reference points that we can look to for the closer association of two things that ordinarily wouldn't necessarily be hanging out together. So then the other school of thought is that there is something about this process very early on that is not deliberate, that is not top down, that is sort of emergent as these two species, for whatever reason, are being forced together in some kind of circumstance which allows this relationship to first get initiated and then get embedded. And then only after that do we then start layering on top of those populations a whole range of other kinds of selection pressures or desires or intended consequences where we are creating um, designer breeds where we're taking two different things together and, and creating things like labradoodles which everybody loves and owns and now they're up and down everybody's street so yeah. yeah somewhere in between those two is something approximating a truth but nobody has any real clue <laughs> i guess as well when you think about it like if you look at wolves and and, and early humans they're going to be hunting similar size prey presumably and also they're both social hunters so they've probably got quite a lot in common as well it's not like trying to tame a a lion or something like that where or well, a tiger maybe something that's a solitary big hunter there's no reason for that animal to to kind of join you but it's another social hunter of a similarish size hunting similarish prey it's not as hard a pill to swallow i suppose and i feel like there are lots of ways in which people have demonstrated there's ways in which there's a community there's an ease of communication where we can recognize each other's intentions we can recognize facial fe um, signatures Eye, eye glances, all that kind of thing, where there are ways in which we can communicate interspecies, as it were, or recognize behaviors in wolves, as you say, who are on the hunt or who are acting as sentries or who are doing other things. We kind of, it's easy for us to interpret those behaviors within our own worldview of things, much more so than a whole range of other organisms. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the idea. I, the degree to which that's been tested, I don't know. And the thing is, I say these things and then every time I say that, somebody comes along and is like, you know what, I have a very close relationship with my chicken and I understand everything that chicken is thinking. And they're not, and I don't want to say that they're wrong because there, you know, I feel like we're always in this position whereby we are perpetually underestimating the communication and f empathy and just general feelings that all the rest of the animal kingdom has. And it always comes as a surprise to us. We're like, oh, look, look how they can communicate. It's like, or look how they can learn or look what these different cultures are. I mean, even just the cover of Nature or Science a week or two ago had um, naked mole rats having culture across different populations where they did things in different ways. We see this with macaques, we see this in not just in primates, we see that all kinds of different things. So I don't, I mean, yes, I think it's intuitive for us, but I'm always worried about that intuition because very often our intuition is completely biased and wrong. And so just because something makes sense doesn't mean that that's necessarily the way that it had to be. Um, but I think there probably is something to this idea that the, the pack hunting nature of wolves and the fact that we're going after similar prey. And so we, they've had a lot more in common than we didn't probably. Yeah. So what's the earliest record of, I mean, this is the million dollar question, I guess, but what's the earliest record of dog domestication? And when did we start to think, oh, hang on a minute, this is, this is no longer looking like what we would call a wolf. It's starting to show these kind of features. So the issue with that is that you, it all depends on the marker of choice. Okay. How are you recognizing what domestication is and what the hell is domestication? <laughs> what do we mean by that? And there is no agreed upon kind of definition or way of thinking about it, or at least a lot of the definitions are set in a presentist, exploitative kind of, this is the dog, the jobs the dog is doing right now or any other species, that's what a domesticated animal is. And so then they say, okay, well, it's a close, ultimately it's about the relationship. It's about a shift in that relationship from either indifferent or antagonistic into a kind of mutualism, into a kind of way in which the two species are getting together and cooperating and become very important in each other's uh, reproduction and life way and the way in which they are uh, exploiting the resources around them and moving and doing all those kinds of things. So how do you recognize a shift in a relationship? 
I mean, even when we talk about ourselves, anybody who's got a partner, when, when, when is the, de when do you, de what's your anniversary date? Is it that everybody uses a different definition, right? Like, yeah. oh, it was our first date. Well, you went on a lot of first dates. Like, you know, maybe it's only become that after the fact, right? So it's always this whole thing. Like, how do we ever define or know what we're looking for in the past when it was happening for the moment that we know only became important later on? And that's a tough thing. But what we can do is we can put bounds on and we can say at least what we're looking for is something that was happening between point A and point B. So point A, we go back in time. We know that at about 40,000 years ago, there's a split between wolf populations that exist now and the wolf population that at some point led to dogs that had this emergent property out because of this closening of the relationship with people. So 40,000 is your, your, it's no earlier than that. Right. And then okay. what we have is there's a burial of a dog at 15,000 years ago at a site called bon Bonhoeffer Castle in Germany. And this dog, from an isotopic perspective, looks like it was eating the same things as the people. It's being buried with people. It looks like it had a disease and was cared for. So all of these are suggestions that people were in close proximity and had an awareness of what this animal was going through. And therefore, you can infer a kind of, you know, these two things were in, in close proximity to each other in life and in death. So if we say that's a, a relationship that we now recognize with the dog that's sleeping at the foot of your bed or on your sofa or anywhere else, then that's 15,000. So that's your upper limit. So somewhere between 40 and 15, something happens. So there's a shift in there. <laughs> and what we're trying to do, along with a bunch of other collaborators uh, and, and a lot of other labs, are trying to winnow that window down. And a paper that we just put out talks about how if we look at the genetic convergence of all of the dogs that are in the Americas, which we know represents this other distinct line of dogs that has doesn't look like it's anywhere else in the world, that, that converges at about, say, 20, 21, 22,000 years ago, something like that, at about the same time and place in a place called Beringia, which is sort of very northeast Siberia that includes Alaska because of the last glacial maximum, sea levels were so low that it became one large landmass, and there was animals and things and going back and forth across that whole region, very high latitude. And that at about this same period of time, we know there's a population of people in Northeast Siberia that are the progenitors of the people who then come into the Americas. And what we can, when we put all this together, when we look at the animal gen or the, the dog genetics, the wolf populations that are in the region and the humans, it looks like we have this kind of a window that's now maybe closer to the 20s. So earlier than 15, but much more recent than 40 and somewhere in the kind of mid 20s ish, there's something taking place. Also curiously, this is right around the last glacial maximum. Everything is super cold and terrible. And we see giant crashes in populations of bison, of bears, of lions, of horses, all kinds of local populations of those animals are going extinct. And we, wolves are getting hit pretty hard too. And we suspect the people are as well. And there might be some kind of climactic forcing as it will, where everybody's suffering a little bit, and maybe the wolf population that was still there with the people that were still where they're kind of forming this relationship, not as a means to kind of survive it, but just because they're being forced into closer proximity, and then things kind of kick off from there. Yeah, that's the idea. So that's this the hypothesis that we put out uh, last month about how this whole thing might have kicked off. So again, it's, it's really an effort to try and narrow that window from 14 to 50, from 40 to 15 and try and come up with a, a, maybe a time and a, and a space that's a bit narrower than that. Yeah, not a, not an easy task at all, like I suspect. And are they the same species then? Have dogs kind of evolved, or not evolved, I guess, I don't know if that's the right word, but have they no, changed? It is, yeah. it is. so are, are they evolved so much from what wolves were? Would they be classed as their own? separate species now or, or are they is it just a wolf in a different packaging it it all so any kind of species question all depends on the, what do you want it to be you know what <laughs> okay. ultimately what is what is the question you're asking because if you have a, a question that depends upon putting different populations into different species boxes because that's always just a top-down human-centered idea of trying to categorize and organize the world. If you want them to be different species because it's important for you to highlight the distinctions between them and it matters in some sort of ecological or behavioral context, sure, you can call them a different species and people do, Canis familiaris versus Canis lupus. But if you instead you want to highlight the similarity between them, then you say, okay, well, maybe it's Canis lupus familiaris. It becomes a subspecies. But it all, all of that is just, I mean, for me, it, it tends to be 
if you're arguing for the sake of it, where are we going with this? I, I'm more interested in the questions that under, underlie all of that, rather than just getting angry about whether somebody refers to it as a species, a subspecies, or no distinction whatsoever. It's just, it's almost irrelevant. Yeah, okay. And I guess one of the interesting things with, with dogs, I mean, is how many different kinds there are, how many different kinds of breeds there are. If you compare cats, for example, I think there's something between, again, like you were saying, depending who you ask, 70 to 30, uh, 30 to 70 uh, breeds of cat, whereas dogs, it's been suggested there's over 330 different breeds of dogs around the world. And I'm not aware of any other domestic animal, uh, and again, feel free to correct me if there are, with, with more breeds than that. We, we seem to have taken the dog and just gone crazy with it in terms of all these different breeds and, and shapes. And I wondered, is there something that makes them so malleable? Or is it a case that in theory, anything could be malleable, but we've just not, not tried so hard with it? I think it's more the latter. I okay. think that and it really, you know, what is a breed? Uh, if you look at, say, chickens or sheep or goats, when we think about land races and how many different populations there are that have been locally adapted to their own circumstances all the way across Eurasia and Australia and Africa and the Americas, I mean, you could, if you wanted to find slice of this, and again, it becomes about a, a box placing an exercise about yeah. what is it read, what is a land race, what, you know, is it recognized by a kennel club, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the real crux here, if we are thinking strictly about dogs and cats, is, again, it, I, for me, it always comes back to the relationship and the, the, the way in which we characterize that relationship. Now, what we can see is that at least by 15,000 years ago, you've got people who are burying dogs with people and who are feeding those dogs and are taking care of those dogs. And that is a very tight, close, mutualistic re relationship there, you, where you are invested in the life of that animal over its lifetime, and then you care about it in death as well. That's a thing. Cat, so, and we've had that for dogs for 15,000 years. So without even getting into what the Victorians then started doing with in terms of like fancy breeds of chickens and pigeons and dogs and everything else, where we start selecting for toward an archetype of a uh, based upon a stud book reference about what it, what it should be. And we start kind of treating them as kind of uh, absolute units as it were of like representatives of what it is we, and so that's really helping to drive ultimately a significant amount of that divergence. But there was a lot of variability already there precisely because dogs and people had just absurdly tight relationships for 15,000 years. Cats are hanging around. Cats are in and around the human niche but they don't come inside until the advent of kitty litter, which is somewhere around kind of World War II-ish or at least mid 20th century. And that therefore, reason, really. and so, yeah. And so yeah. you will, people are aware of cats and they're on ships, but they are nowhere near the kind of, they're not within the sphere of people in the way that dogs are. They're not, and you, they're not in houses. They're not being buried. They're not give, ascribed names. They are around, they're like pigeons for a lot of people in Trafalgar Square or elsewhere. They're tolerated and they are appreciated for the things that they're doing and, you know, whether that's ratting or mousing or whatever else, but they're kind of free to do their own thing. And so that relationship is already one step removed. And unless you have, because cats have only entered into that very inner sanctum of, of human kind of care and looking after, and now we're declawing them and keeping them indoors at all times and, you know, really investing ourselves in our cats. That's a ridiculously short period of time. And we're talking less than hundred years and dogs, we've got 15,000 years. So it's maybe even more remarkable that we have as much variability in cats as we do, given the short, the really ridiculously short yeah. period of time that we've been in this intense relationship with them. Whereas dogs, we've has been around with us for much, much longer. Okay, that makes more. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that. I, I don't know. You, you're not not the sort of thing you'd know, I guess. But I didn't realize we hadn't had cats for that long uh, in in our homes, really. So not not long in the grand scheme of things at all. So how long did it take then? From well, so you, we've got the wolf. We've got that there. How long before we're looking? Okay, that's a dog now. Or again, I, I guess these questions are very hard to pinpoint, aren't they? I keep chucking them at you, and it's again. I guess it depends who you. I'm, I'm guessing what you're going to say is it depends who you ask and what parameters you use. Well, it depends on what you want to see. What it says, the answer to that says more about you than it does about the dog, okay. right? Because it says, what do, what do I prioritize? What do I consider important? What is my judgment about what matters for defining yeah. what a dog is? And then you can go back and say, oh, well, the first time we see that is X, the X thousand right. years ago in X place. But that says, that's how you want to define it. But what we're talking about is a long-term continuum. And yeah. what matters really is, again, that the nature of the relationship, and I think what's more interesting is to say, in what ways are dogs integrating into human societies? So okay. what's a, there's a, a colleague of mine has this brilliant story, uh, sort of semi-published, which I just think is one of the more amazing things that has ever been turned up about dogs, where at about eight, eight and a half thousand years ago, 
you have populations of hunter-gatherers in the southeast corner of the US, in southern Scandinavia, and in Japan, northern Japan, all of which are, again, hunter-gatherers. We we're talking about no settled agriculture here. We're not talking about large populations. All three of those things in really disparate parts of the world, not communicating with each other, all have dogs. And they venerate those dogs to such a degree that they're burying them, sometimes individually and sometimes with grave goods that match or exceed the grave goods that are, the, that are in the human variants. So these dogs are not just kind of like hanging around as companions and not just there as bed warmers or anything else. These dogs are absolutely critical to the life ways of those populations in those spaces and time. And what's really fun is you can then start to correlate that with the sorts of environments that they're in, the kinds of prey that they may have been hunting and how dogs would have been valuable for that kind of prey. But what happens is whatever you see this both at an individual level. If you have a dog, you will certainly love that dog as though it's either a child or a parent or a friend or whatever else. Like this dog matters to you. And in the same way, you can have a cultural association where dogs are no different than your material culture, no different than any of the kind of other aspects that you define yourself by or that you surround yourself with to say, this is part of who I am as a human being. Dogs are that closely integrated, but the way in which those dogs are integrated has, as you well know, has like a phenomenal variability. So you get like Portuguese water dogs where they're very important in for the, the, the fishermen and they actually start to evolve things around their, their uh, paws to make them better swimmers. You have sled dogs in the north, you've got um, uh, ratters, you've got terriers, you've got, you know, you've got in, in uh, the uh, Industrial Revolution in the UK, you had pit turn dogs, which were like just turning wheels as though they were hamsters. You, you've got koi dogs in Hawaii that were there before the Europeans arrived, which are kind of more for eating. And, you know, it's just like what, and the same thing you've got chihuahuas in South America, in Central and South America. You've got all kinds of ways in which dogs are fitting into those societies, but are being treated as though they are that human society. And I think the more, rather than going, okay, so what's a dog and what isn't a dog? It's more like, let's look at those individual societies and almost down to those individuals themselves and say, how is it, that, what is the defining characteristics of that relationship as people grow up with those dogs around and that's, and looking at that variability and that's just phenomenal. The other really fun thing about it for me is that this relationship, we know it's there by 15,000. It probably precedes that by a couple of thousand. Our species is about say 300,000 years old. So the vast majority of time that there have been human beings that you and I would recognize if they walk down the street in modern clothes is no different from us, cognitively, behaviorally, size-wise, anything else. But it's only in the last 15,000 years that we have this relationship. And when you think about how now we think about, we don't really think of ourselves as, as alone in that regard. It's, it's now, we are very often for many cultures over thousands of years are defined by the animals and plants that we surround ourselves with and dogs are, have been right there from the beginning. I find that fascinating when you're saying that, uh, so for example, there were dogs in the Americas before uh, Europeans got there, before Western settlers got there and you mentioned Japan. So is that a case of, of convert, again, you're gonna know the terms better than me, is that a case of convergent evolution then where these things are happening in separate places at roughly the same time, basically. In the case of those three examples that I gave you in the southeast corner of the US, the southern Scandinavia and Japan, yeah, I mean, yeah. what you, you, you can see that there are, that dogs have integrated themselves into those societies and they're all, they're all dogs. You know, they're, they're not like, they're probably still only coming from a single source that goes way back, but they have acquired unique, distinctive genetic and morphological characteristics simply by virtue of the fact that they're closely tied with human populations that have nothing to do with other human populations other, in other parts of the globe. So that's just an evolutionary divergence. You're just talking about time and space. Time plus yeah. space is just is evolution. It's changed through time. So the fact that all three of those then are pursuing similar life ways or venerating their dogs in, in, the, in similar ways is, as you say, really fascinating because what it means is that you know, does that mean how much is there like a climactic forcing of can you look at the characteristics of the environments in which these people are in with dogs and then predict that dogs are going to be very important to those people? You know, they kind of happen upon similar solutions to the same kinds of problems that they're being faced with. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's obvious that we've changed them, but dogs change people as well. I remember reading about how uh, they can they can pick up uh, social cues on people. They can they can read your your face and they can read your emotion. Um, are there any other ways that you know that that dogs have have changed us as a, as a species? I whether they're changing us or us changing them, I think in many ways what you can see is parallel changes in the ways in which we are responding to shifts in our environment. So a classic one is this um, amylase that you you in your saliva you have this ability to break down um, starches. So 
with we as as you acquire and you start eating more starchy material in order to break that down in your saliva you have populations that are uh, that have a greater association with this although the timing of it is a little bit off tend to have more copies of this amylase gene and the same appears to be true for dogs that the, that a lot of wolves, a lot of other wild canids only have say two copies of it, but there's a whole lot of modern domestic dogs that have many more copies than that. And there's this idea that humans and dogs are going through similar evolutionary pathways here as they become more accustomed to eating a diet that is high, more rich in starch. Uh, we see this, uh, there's a, a great example on the Tibetan plateau where we know that the people who are living there have a gene called EPAS1, which it appears that they acquired from Denisovans, which just allows you to survive at higher latitudes because it, you're able to hold on to that oxygen when in a very yeah. oxygen deprived environment. Well, it turns out the dogs that are existing on the same plateau also have a variable version of EPAS1, which it appears they received from the high altitude wolves that were there. So we kind of, we're going through this simultaneously. And so whatever is happening to us, genomically at a population level or selection wise, but also demographically. The very first time that Europeans arrive into the Americas, it's just all hell breaks loose. They bring these diseases, there's this persecution, they have horses, they have guns, they've got, it's just crazy. And the, the modern, the human population that's there, which was sizable, apparently the, um, there was more than a million people in and around St. Louis since sort of the mid 15th century. And then Europeans show up and just wipe out the Native Americans to the tune of 95% or more. Guess what happens to the dogs? Same damn thing. Millions of dogs, about 95 or more percent of them disappear as well. So we are so connected to each other and so in tune with each other and experiencing the same thing at the same time that whatever is happening to the people, you can bet is happening to the dogs and vice versa. So which makes for a very interesting shared evolutionary and cultural history between, between us and our dogs. I remember talking to uh, one because I, I do a bit of part time lecturing at the University of Nottingham and one of the lecturers there was telling me because I've, I've got a, a miniature dachshund. She said, oh, yeah, your, your gut bacteria will be very similar because if you mm. live with a dog, you're, un, you know, unintentionally is licking your face or whatever. And I thought, oh, I don't know if there's any negatives or positives to that. But it just said that if you if you tested someone who didn't have a dog compared to you, you'll have different uh, bacteria and stuff, to that, which I thought was, you know, an interesting thing to. To say to someone. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a hell of a lot more shared than differences, despite the fact that we are what 55, 60 million years divergent. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, Just... yes, we're both mammals, but beyond that, like we're <laughs> pretty different lineages. And yet, there is all of this, especially when you start it's when you start living with another organism, you're gonna there's gonna be a lot of mutualistic shared things there. And and gut microbiome or um, oral microbiome, sure, you know, there's gonna why not? That's <laughs> why why you not share can it with share your dog? It, you will, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, focusing back on the wolves a little bit, there's been a lot of talk of, of rewilding in, in the UK, as I'm sure you're aware. And obviously, if you come from America, there's, there's, there's wolves there. But I wonder what your thoughts were on the reintroduction of, of wolves in the UK. Is it something that you think is a bit of a pipe dream or do you think it's a practicality to it here? Well, it's a bit outside my remit. I mean, I know there's, <laughs> there's a lot of interesting argument. And one thing that we are certainly interested in as a background to this is when did wolves go extinct in the UK? We know that they were here and yeah. we have some ancient wolf bones that are genomically are turning up some interesting things. And what nobody's really certain of is when do the wolves disappear? And what were people referring to those wolves as before and after they disappeared? And, you know, there's that, there's a classic uh, Roman um, mosaic that shows a wolf, but it was clearly done by somebody who has no idea what a wolf is. <laughs> you know? Is that Ro like, Romulus and Remus? Is it that one? No, it's a different one. Different and it's one. like, okay. it kind of has the back end of what a horse is, and it's got this weird face about it and everything else. <laughs> so there's kind of, there's all kinds of ways to approach this question. And I think that's, a, that's very always in, important for rewilding too. If you don't, you don't know when something went extinct, you don't know the reasons for it going extinct, then it's difficult to make an argument for putting it back in. Um, Having said that, and I know that there's a lot of people who are very much in favor of it because there's all these knockdown, knock-on effects, and there's that famous video about uh, Yellowstone when they reintroduce the wolves and how the entire ecosystem then responds because the there's a different behavior amongst the prey, which then changes the flora and fauna in different open spaces, and that allows things to grow. And then the beavers start doing something, like, ah, just like <laughs> boom, 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 all the way down this whole cascade. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's been successful reintroductions of, of wild taxa, kind of as you say, an apex predator having significant keystone effects on a whole lot of other species. And sure, you know, there's there's lots of reasons uh, why that would be a cool thing to do. But then you don't want to then just prioritize them at all costs because 
there's a reason that wolves aren't here in the first place. And what are those reasons? And we need to take those into consideration. We can't just say, oh, well, the wolves are more important than the farmers and the sheep and the landscape and everything else that is has also uh, got to have a say at the table. So um, th I think there's a lot of research that has to go into this and a lot of different things that need to be balanced. But it's certainly uh, an intriguing idea. And I think for a lot of people, you know, it's there's a real romance to it. And yeah. you know, the people are talking about, you know, Pleistocene Park in Siberia and the reintroduction of beavers here as a success. And, you know, I, there, there's something to it. We had uh, Hannah O'Regan on last week and she was talking about beers in Britain. And, you know, I, we, I talked to her about it. And again, I love the idea of beers here, but I think the practicalities are, are maybe not not quite well. I'm sure she mentioned wolves might have been around the 14th century that but i don't again i don't know if that's concrete or if that's just from the research no, i mean got. it may well be but i think it's yeah. more what, what need, we need the, the uncertainty is the emphasis well, nobody yeah. has any nobody yeah, has yeah, any yeah. definitive empirical evidence saying this is the last wolf that we see it all goes yeah after that. okay fair enough well before we go uh, i'm guessing you're a dog person or hope you're a dog person so what what's your favorite breed have you got a favorite breed of dog ah <sighs> You know, there's all kinds of ethics around breeding too um, yeah. that we didn't really get into. But I mean, there was a reason. It's been over 15 years or more that BBC stopped showing Crufts. And there are yeah. all kinds of sketchy things around, you know, what, what are the ethics of humans pushing the biological extremes of these animals where if yeah. you were to see those same mutations in humans, you would be absolutely appalled. But somehow it's okay. And, yeah. and people, yeah, are breeding, yeah. people are breeding pigeons to, to not have any beaks because that's just a neat thing to look at. So then they have to ah. feed them with an eyedropper because the pigeons are incapable of eating. You know, there's, there's issues around this. So. Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. So, so, know, maybe it's, you, so maybe it's more the point that people shouldn't have a favorite breed and we should just enjoy dogs for what they are. Yeah, I, I think that it's about, you know, you can say, well, you know, what sort of size or, you know, what, what is it? The question is, if you have a favorite breed, what is it about that breed that, that most attracts you? You know, yeah. what, what are the characteristics of a dog that you most favor? Yeah. Is it a size thing? Is it a shape thing? Is it a color thing? Is it a behavior thing? But people then, the other thing that I, I have a book at home with like 150 breeds in it or something like this. And, and it was fascinating to me that on every page was a, a glossy picture and a series of bullet points describing it. And they always use the singular. They always say, this breed does this. This breed likes this. This breed needs so much. And it's like, as if there is zero variability in the dogs that make up that breed and of course there is i mean we're talking these are not these are not like absolute units <laughs> these no. are not, they are not archetypes that just get stamped out of a machine and come to you <laughs> pre-packaged in a, in, a, in a parcel that's too big from amazon right like these are they're all individual dogs and they all have their own individual histories and yes they might have things that about them that are kind of that are maybe associated with the breed, but anytime somebody does a study to say, what is the variability within this breed? It all falls down. Like we, we like to think of these things as singular, but they're really not. And in a way, people know that on an individual level. I mean, the analogy is like, if you ask most Americans, what do you think of Congress? They all say, oh, it's terrible. They're all full of, it's full of terrible people. What do you think of your congressman? Oh, he or she is great. You know, it's like, we, we know our own individual dogs, and yet we ascribe a singular set of characteristics to the breed overall, which probably has absolutely no basis in empirical fact about that particular breed. So I, I'm kind of, I just like dogs. Like, yeah, I, I just, good answer. When I see them, and my daughter is the same, like every time she sees a dog, it doesn't matter the size of the shape. She's always like, we always ask, you know, can we pet your dog? But it, it doesn't matter. You just put your hand out and the dog's, and it's, I just think all dogs are pretty great. I saw um, some pictures and I, I mean, it must have been when photography was was just about in its early, early infancy. And you see like what a, an English pit bull would have looked like then and, mm. and what a, a German shepherd or all, and then they compare it to now. And some of them are quite dry. I mean, uh, I think English bulldogs are a really good example of that. It looked more like what you'd class a Staffordshire bull terrier. And then you look at it now and it's almost like a, a horror film to how they've changed. So, no, I, yeah, I agree. Well, it's not... Um, it's not something we should be proud of really for some of these breeds because it's pretty no absolutely not and especially horrific. because then what by closing these gene pools and going for uh, a phenotype by having saying this is a breed standard and ignoring everything underneath because in order to have a standard you have to have homogeny not just at the phenotype level but at the genotype level too that's what ends up happening so you end up sweeping the entire genome free of any variability and then you allow all of these negative mutations to pop up and become the ones that just proliferate. So you get the phenomenal amounts of hip dysplasia and um, uh, 
predilections toward all kinds of other diseases that then manifest sometimes very early on and more cancer and all kinds of stuff. It's just really pretty sketchy. So um, yeah, I've got a stat for you. Ni mid 19th century, average size of a pug in the UK was 23 pounds. Average size of a pug now, eight pounds. So wow. you know, less than 50%, well, less than 50% of the uh, it just dropped because again, we like to think these things as fixed, but as soon as we name it, we change it. And then people are pushing toward biological extremes at all points. So it's just, yeah, it's pretty crazy. That is mental. Well, look, that's opened my eyes uh, to, to all of it. And it's interesting to hear, you know, in, in a relative time span, how quickly these things change and, and happen. So look, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Gregor, and thanks for coming on. No, it's a real thrill. Thanks very much for having me.